I am a researcher, uh, I'm an economist, but I'm also a citizen. And uh, my point of view about uh, economy uh, and social science that uh, is that uh, economy and social sciences uh, should um, should um, should be inside the city and not outside the city. It means uh, that I was uh, always uh, very much uh, um, occurred about um, very concrete uh, problems. Uh, as I was a student, uh, I have always uh, tried uh, to couple uh, theoretical thought, uh, concepts, and real problem, real social problems. So I'm not an abstract uh, social scientist. I am uh, very much involved uh, inside the city. And as um, as uh, David said, um, um, I think it's very important not to be outside the city, but to, to be really inside the city and inside within the public debate. So um, I will present um, uh, some thoughts about uh, industrial urgency. This is the topic I'm working about uh, since I've been a student. It's not uh, new for me uh, at all. Uh, as I was a student a uh, couple of <laughs> years before, uh, I was very much afraid about disindustrialization. Uh, my thought was that, um, and I will say that afterwards, that uh, a, con a country uh, cannot be uh, developed uh, or cannot develop uh, with, without any uh, industry or uh, productive basis. And, um <coughs> and uh, 30 years after that, I'm even more convinced about uh, this, uh, this uh, position. I will try uh, to explain you why. So I have written a book uh, for a little bit more than two years with the title Urgence Industrielle, and Industrielle in French. The, the translation is, of course, uh, Industrial Urgency. And this book is, uh, for the first time in my, in my life, not an academic book. Uh, it is a book written for the citizens uh, to try to explain them why is industry important. And in my opinion, uh, industry is a common good, uh, should not be considered only as a private or a public problem. And I think uh, all citizens should consider uh, that uh, the industry is a common good that should be uh, developed. So, industrial urgency. Uh, the, the plan I will follow is, uh, is the one you have uh, under your eyes. Uh, I will try to explain why today the place of industry is a little bit better recognized today, just a little bit better recognized today. There is some debates about industry. Uh, I will then focus on the reasons, there are a lot of reasons, uh, to explain the industrial decline in probably almost all developed countries. And after that, being, as I told you, a citizen, uh, I will try to uh, explain you uh, which could be the components of an industrial contract. I propose an industrial contract and I've proposed this industrial contract as, as it was being said uh, in Greece, but also in France. I have uh, um, constituted an association uh, with the name Manifest de Pôle Industrie. And this uh, association is known by the public bodies. And I try to, to promote this uh, industrial contract. And this industrial contract, in my opinion, is at the heart of a new development model. So we should think about this uh, new in the development model in relation with this uh, industrial contract. It's clearly normative. Uh, it's absolutely normative, it's, uh, without any doubt. But I'm absolutely convinced that it's impossible to be a social scientist without being normative. So, um, 
first some words about the place of the industry, uh, which is a bit better recognized today. Um, as I told you a long time, uh, the industry was considered as marginal. And I think uh, that uh, the um, economists um, bear a really heavy responsibility about this point. Uh, you know probably uh, Colin Clark or some French uh, economists as Jean Forestier. Have you ever heard from them? Colin Clark is really well known. Eh? And uh, Colin Clark uh, has uh, developed uh, a theory, the, the word is really too much, but an idea, I would say, uh, that uh, the development of a country has to pass through uh, several steps. And the idea is the primary sector, the secondary sector, and, as you know, the, the third sector, or tertiary tertiar sector. Tertiary, I pense. Tertiary. There's a uh, sector. It means that when a country develops, first of all, it develops by the agriculture, and then, as we know, by countries as uh, Great Britain or Germany or even France, the agriculture sector declines and leaves the place uh, to the industry. And when the development processes go goes on, uh, then the tertiary sector, the services. Uh, slowly uh, take the place of the industry as it was the case as the industry took the place of the agriculture. So the idea, the main idea, is that development has to do with industrial decline and development of uh, services. So uh, the idea was that uh, a developed country is a country with, uh, for example, for instance, 70% of employment in services something like 20% in industrial sector, 20-25, and 5% or something like that in the agriculture. And this idea of uh, uh, the natural industrial decline and the natural development of services is uh, really uh, very much anchored in the, uh, in the spirit of, uh, of a lot, uh, probably the most uh, of uh, economists. So here, uh, I say that uh, uh, this is a point of representation. What do we consider uh, as a development pro process? It's a point of representation. So what are our representations about uh, development? The idea is that development has something to do with the decline of industry. And it's not, uh, it's not a pity. It's uh, just normal that uh, the industry decline left uh, the place of the of the, of the less less is place and and uh, the services take the place of the industry slowly, and what we di discover now slowly is uh, uh, that uh, no country and I have written that in red, no country can remain without developed productive base. It doesn't mean that uh, we don't need the services. But the point is, what sort of, of services do we need? Uh, do we need uh, services for the people? Do we need uh, to have uh, everywhere laundries or cafes or restaurants? Or do we need high added value services? And these added value services do work with the industry. Uh, if you uh, consider the example of Germany, uh, Germany has a very strong industrial basis and two very strong high added value services working for the industry. Well, um, this is a point if we uh, are looking about already developed countries as Germany. If we uh, consider now developing countries, and not developed countries, developing countries, as for example, China. Of course, I take this example. In which sector China do develop? Is it in agriculture? Is it in services? The answer is uh, 
absolutely clear, it is an industrial sector which is uh, growing. And I could take all emergent countries and we could try to calculate what is the, the part of the industry in the growth and you will always find that the part of the industry is the main part. It is the industry and the industry exportations mainly which uh, are in the position uh, to uh, pool uh, the economic development. So this observation, in my opinion, fits as well for developed countries and for developing countries. If we take uh, um, the French example, then you will see that direct and indirect industrial jobs, I was talking about services working for, for the industry, or services linked to the industry. So if you aggregate uh, these jobs, direct and indir indirect industrial jobs, they represent 45% of the total, total employment in the market sector. It has no sense to have the total employment uh, in general. You have, a for, of course, to evaluate the part in relation to the market sector. If you have the, the whole populace, population working, of course, the, the, the ratio is, uh, has, no, has no sense. So here is uh, the uh, ratio if you take the employment. And this ratio is the worst one for the industry uh, and uh, for, um, yeah, for the industry or for the productive sector uh, in the part. If you take not the employment, but if you take the exportations or the R&D expenditures and you try to, to weight the, the part of the industry, direct and, and indirect part, then you have 80% of all exportations are industrial exportations and 85% of R&D expenditures. So the general thesis uh, that the industrial sector is not so important, well, I, I cannot really understand how is it possible to prove it. But if, if you just take these figures, then you see that, uh, of course, even today, industrial uh, countries, the industry and the industrial sector yeah. plays a very important role. If something is not clear, uh, please you can interrupt me. Of course, it's, no, it's not a problem. Eh? If there is uh, any technical problem, you can interrupt me, of course. Well, um, okay, if we admit that, we have also to admit uh, that in uh, most developed countries, um, the uh, industry, anyway, uh, declines. Um, it is also true for uh, exploitations, except, except in Germany. Uh, Germany is a very interesting, uh, interesting um, country related to industry. And perhaps in the debate, I don't know if you have prepared a question like that, or we can discuss it or not if you want. This is uh, your, your, your choice. Why is uh, uh, the industrial sector in Germany uh, so resisting? So for me, it's really an, a very important point. Why do we consider a decline in most countries, in France as well as in uh, America, but not in Germany? In Germany, the industrial sector uh, is even growing. So it's, I think it's really interesting. But except Germany, what we see is that the industrial job losses and plant closures seems to be accelerating right, everywhere except in Germany. The situation of the USA is uh, uh, very much contrasted. To finish uh, this uh, first point, this is a, a sort of uh, introduction, uh, uh, recognizing that the place of industry is better recognized. I would like to stress uh, one point, what is, in my opinion, very important, is that the decline of the industry, of industry, has macroeconomic effects. And these macroeconomic effects have, have been neglected, 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 no? 
uh, but today we, th we see them uh, much better. Uh, if we, for example, consider the situation of France, uh, I have calculated uh, that if the industrial surplus, uh, I mean the difference between exportations and importations of industrial goods, if the industrial surplus was neutral, was zero, it means of course so much exportations as importations, we would have in France between 2.5 and 3% more GNP growth. And I think it is really important. I don't know if you really understand what this means. It means that we have today uh, a growth of around 1% or something like that per year. If we would have just a surplus and a zero surplus, we would have in France around 3% growth of the GNP each year. And this changes a lot. Uh, the consequences of that is very important. And it means that because of the trade deficit in the industry, in the industrial sector, we lose points of growth. Of course, we lose employment. It explains a part, partly unemployment. And of course, we, we lose revenues and tax revenues. And losing taxi, tax revenues, of course, we have a worsening of the public deficit. And what I say here for France is absolutely true, but in the discussion I, would, I could give you the, the data for Greece which are absolutely unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. It means, in my opinion, that the whole debate in Greece about the public debt, which is uh, really uh, taking place uh, everywhere and uh, it is the main discussion, the public debt, or is the public debt sustainable or not sustainable, is of course a very important question. I don't say it's not important, but the main question is not that. The, the main question is that the propension to import in Greece is extreme high. It means uh, that uh, there is, of course, no surplus uh, in trade uh, industry in, in Greece, and the ratio, the ratio, exportation, importations, you understand, no? exportations to importation, the ratio in Greece is how much, you think? In, in the hundred, uh, in percent. Less than 50%. You are absolutely right. In long term, 28%. 28%. And this is just impossible. It's just impossible. I mean, that it's just impossible that a country survives with such a ratio. You cannot import 100 if you export 28. It's impossible. You can say, I export 90. I import 100, but with the services and uh, the export of services, tourism, for example, eh, I try to have a current balance which is more or less at the equilibrium, but with 28%, it's absolutely impossible. Eh? And today, uh, it is more than 28%, it is 50%, 50, as you said, in Greece. And it's 50%. Why it is 50% in Greece and not 28? It was 28 uh, in 2008. Now it's 50%. Why? They reduce? Imports. Exactly. And how did they do to reduce import? Did they forbid uh, the importations? Exactly. You, re you reduce import, I I I income. If you reduce uh, the income, the income in Greece are reduced in around 50%. Uh, of course, if the people do not uh, buy any more cars and things like that, the importations, of course, uh, go down. It's exactly the same with the investment. The investment uh, side is, uh, since uh, 2008 have been reduced uh, in, in around 65% uh, in Greece. So if you reduce 
of course, consumption and investment, and of course the importations uh, uh, are going down and are going strongly down. But going, going uh, really strongly down, uh, the ratio exportations to uh, importation is still very low, 50%. So y you see, uh, I have calculated uh, that to, ha to have a, a, a natural surplus, a zero, uh, uh, the uh, consumption in Greece has to fall down again around 30-35%, which is absolutely impossible uh, because <laughs> if you do like that, then you will have unemployment uh, in high, I would say, of 40% or 50% unemployment. So, of course, absolutely uh, impossible. Did you understand what I, what I said? This hope uh, ra rather clear. So, of course, the situation is not that uh, in France, but it's not that high, but the idea is exactly the same. And eh? the, the tendency, it's exactly, it's exactly the same. And um, this is uh, the macroeconomic and social problems related uh, to industrial decline. So it was the first part, the, the sort of uh, introduction to explain you why very slowly, very slowly in the debate, the place of industry is a little bit more, a little bit better recognized today. Especially, I would say, in America. Uh, the American debate about the place of industry is today a little bit more intensive as it was for uh, 14 years. So I will try now to, um, to explain which are the uh, reasons of uh, the industrial uh, decline. So the, re the reasons are a lot. Uh, I'm not going to explain you each of them. I would uh, speak until five, five o'clock and it would be not enough. Eh? Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of reasons and all these reasons converge. This is very important. And saying that, it means too, of course, that there is no miracle recept which would be enough uh, to uh, go out of this industrial decline. The idea that I have this solution to stop uh, uh, the industrial decline is, uh, of course, absolutely stupid. If there are a bundle of reasons uh, explaining uh, the industrial decline, it means that this the problem is complex and it means that there is no one solution, but there are a lot of solutions and this lot of solutions are systemic and systemic means that you have to change the model. Eh? Th this is the general idea. So, which are the reasons uh, which are frequently uh, given in the public debate? debate eh? well, what what uh, when the, the economists or the politicians talk about industrial decline and when they try to explain, to, to say why there is an, ex an industrial decline, they are using uh, some arguments. The most frequently uh, reasons which are pushed uh, in front are the one you have here. So I will just say a few words about them. In my opinion, uh, they are not the main reasons, but we have to consider them uh, uh, to, to understand if uh, they are right, not right, uh, do they count or not. A bad specialization. This is a, uh, um, um, a point which is in, uh, in France uh, very much discussed uh, within uh, industrial uh, uh, economists. Uh, we, consider, we consider, I consider too, uh, that uh, uh, the French uh, uh, specialization, uh, industrial specialization is a bad specialization and it means price sensible. Price sensible, what does it mean? It means that, for example, when the exchange rate of the euro is too high, then this uh, uh, has a negative effect on the exportations. It's much more difficult to export with an expensive euro than to export with a euro in, uh, uh, I would say, neutral uh, exchange uh, rate. 
Um, you can discuss that. You can discuss that uh, the whole night uh, because um, uh, this argumentation is probably right. But the question is then, is then why is the industry uh, specialized in these uh, sectors? It's just a constatation. No? But if you constate something, constate, eh? if, if you see something, you say, well, there is a bad specialization and this explains uh, the industrial decline. Is the question just afterwards, why is, it, is the French uh, industry bad uh, specialized? Why is the German industry not price sensible? If you do not give an answer, it's just an observation you do, but this, ex uh, this uh, observation you do is not enough. Uh, you, you have, of course, as an economist, to try to understand which are the institutional processes uh, leading to a bad specialization. So you see, you open a box, uh, and this box is, of course, a, a very huge box. Again, very often it's said uh, the costs are too, are too high, uh, especially the labor costs uh, are too high. Direct and indirect uh, labor costs are too high. And this explanation is very often used to explain the delocations. Uh, when uh, uh, some French uh, sectors, industry, firms do close plants in France and transfer them in China, for example, uh, uh, the idea, or in Ireland, or even in other countries, uh, of course, is said that uh, the labor cost, uh, the direct cost, and indirect labor costs are too high, and uh, this explains delocations or it explains at least uh, the um, job loss uh, in the industry because in order uh, to, to save uh, the um, uh, price advantage, uh, the firms automatize and try to have a higher productivity uh, to cover the cost. Uh, and of course, if you try to have a higher productivity uh, without uh, a turnover which is growing in the same proportions, it means that, of course, the, 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 the size of the, of the people working inside the industry is, of course, uh, reducing. So it's not necessarily wrong. Uh, these arguments are not necessarily wrong. I just say that these are just observations uh, which leads to real debates. And generally, we just consider that the costs are too high and we stop. And the answer is, if the costs are too high, we have to reduce the cost. We have to reduce the cost. It means that we have to reduce the wages to restore competitiveness, or we have to reduce the social cost to, reduce, to, to, to increase the competitiveness. But you, this explanation is, is not really uh, convincing. I, I remind you just uh, that uh, in, in uh, most uh, industrial sectors, the labor cost, the direct labor cost, do not represent more than 20% of the global cost. 80% of the global costs are not labor cost. Uh, very close to uh, the idea of bad specialization and uh, too high cost is the idea that, um, that uh, our, our currency in Europe, the euro, of course, uh, is overestimated, but I've already talked about that. I don't want to stress it again. I move to other arguments. The two small places of the small and medium uh, enterprises. And this is uh, always uh, given in contrast to Germany. Uh, in contrast to Germany, where we said that uh, there is a um, Mittelstand in, in Germany. The Mittelstand are the medium firms uh, which are uh, supposed uh, to be very important in Germany and uh, leading the whole industry. I am very skeptical about this argument, very skeptical. It doesn't mean that the medium firms are not important, uh, they are important, but again the question, the question is why are the medium firms not so developed? It's, not, uh, it's again an observation you may do, 
but you don't explain why uh, the medium frames are not so developed. And I'm skeptical too about Germany uh, when uh, some economists uh, stress too quickly, in my opinion, that the big firms are not so important in Germany. Uh, we see that with the uh, Volkswagen affair. Uh, we have, uh, you have seen probably in the press, in the economic press, in the economic medias, that uh, the it has been done a calculation uh, what is the weight of Volkswagen exportations in whole industrial German exportations. And do you know what is the weight of it? The weight of VW exportations in industrial exportation of whole Germany. The exportation just of this group. 18%. Do you consider that? It's, it's, it's quite a lot. 18% uh, just Volkswagen uh, for the whole industrial uh, German exportation. So the idea that the medium firms uh, in Germany are very important. Yes, they are very important, but very important too is their relation to the German groups. They work for the German group, the, the medium, uh, the medium uh, firms. So another observation very close to what I s just said is bad relations between big enterprises and their suppliers. Here, I would like to stress one point. I will go back to this point afterwards. Yes, you see, I am here talking about relations. Relations between big enterprises and suppliers, which are uh, some of them small and medium firms. Why is it important to stress this point, relations? It's important, and I will use it afterwards, because here you see that there is a particular way to see the industry. The industry is not a sum of enterprises, is not this enterprise plus this enterprise plus this enterprise, or industry is not this sector plus this sector plus this sector. The industry is a system. And if you have in, t in the mind that industry is a sector, I will go back uh, about this point afterwards, it means something very important. If you want to support the system, you, you should not make a very big mistake, mistake about the elementary unit of the system. The elementary, elementary unit on the, of the system is always the interrelation. Do you understand what I say? Eh? The elementary unit of a system is the interrelation, is never a single firm. If you want to have a, an industrial policy, I will go back on this point afterwards, it means you cannot help single firms. If you consider industry as a system, you just have to support the interrelations between the sectors, the industry, the firms, and not to have a, um, a direct support uh, related to firms and especially to big firms. So, of course, the relations between enterprises, between big enterprises and their suppliers, is a true argument uh, related to uh, the density, I would say, and the competitiveness of industry. I will go back on this point afterwards. Tropism on services, and I've already talked about this point, I don't want to stress it again, and about High technologies. This is uh, very important in countries as America and France. Uh, if uh, some people, some politicians uh, talk about industry in France to say industry is, is important, they are always talking about high-tech industries. It means uh, nuclear plants, uh, weapon industries, electronic uh, telecommunications, biotechnologies, and they just consider that uh, not high-tech technologies are belonging to the past. 
this is an opinion which is really very broad, diffused in, in France. And here, again, in contrast with Germany, if you uh, try to measure what is the weight of high-tech industries in Germany, the answer is absolutely clear. The answer is that high-tech industries in the German industrial sector are around 15%, 15 and not 50. The main part of the industrial sector in Germany is medium tech sector. Medium tech sector, the definition of medium tech or high tech is high tech is uh, a sector uh, spending more than 3% of the turnover for R&D expenditures. This is the definition of the OECD. If we define what is a high tech sector, according to the definition of the OECD, the idea is that more than 3% of the turnover is spent to cover the R&D expenditures, okay? If you are between 1.5 and 3%, then you are a medium technology sector, and less than 1%, then you are in a uh, rather low-tech uh, sector. So if you consider uh, the mechanical industry, if you consider the automotive industry, these are typical medium tech uh, sectors. High tech, sector, high tech sector is, for example, aerospace, uh, of course, or biotechnologies. If you measure, if you try to consider the weight of uh, the high tech technologies in, the, in Germany, this is, as I told you, 15%. But here I would like to be uh, very precise. Please do not confuse high tech and high prices. Huh? You may have a medium tech uh, development with high added value products and high prices. This is absolutely typical for the German uh, industrial for the German industrial sector, concentrated in medium tech, producing high added value products and high prices. Uh, so, no confusion between high technologies and high added value. It's, it's, a, it's a really very important to distinguish clearly that. And a last reason given frequently to um, explain the industrial decline is a too low growth. What does it mean? It means that big firms are uh, very much concerned with their market. They are always looking where are the dynamic markets and considering that the firms are investing on the places where the dynamic of demand is very strong. So if uh, the dynamic of demand is too low, too lazy in Europe or in France, what are doing the big industrial firms? They are locating their investments in the places where the dynamic of the demand is much more, uh, much more higher, it's, it's higher, it's more, it's more, it's more acute, okay? And doing that, investing, investing in China, investing in America, this has a, a feedback effect, of course, they do not invest in France, they do not invest in Europe, and not investing in Europe, this explains partly, of course, uh, a growth which is too, too lazy. You understand that? There, there is, at the beginning, the idea that the demand is dynamic in China, is dynamic in America. The firms are always searching where is the demand, where is the market. They invest there, but investing there, they reinforce the growth in these countries or in these regions and the feedback effect is of course negative in Europe and in France because uh, the part of the whole investment realized uh, in Europe or in, in France is too, too low. Okay? You understand uh, the, 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 circulus, uh, the vicious circulus or the virtuous uh, uh, circle. So uh, which arm? Je déborde un peu là. Il me reste 20 minutes. 
Il me reste 20 minutes. Non, non, je n'ai pas fini. Non, non, je suis en train de Ok, ok. Ok, ok, ok. Merci pour le modérateur et sa compréhension. Donc, je vais essayer d'être un peu plus rapide. Je voudrais like to stress deux, trois ou trois plus, franchement, raisons qui ne sont pas tellement discutées dans le débat public. Les trois raisons sont that uh, you have on under your eyes, and I will go back to each of them rather quickly. One reason of the industrial decline, which is not debated, is the extravation, or you could say the financialization of the big groups. I will go back to this point in a minute. And if an efficient industrial policy, I've already talked a little bit, a bit about that, and I will go back to, to that, an outdated conception of work and even of competitiveness. And all these reasons, the reason we talked about before and this one, converge and work as a system, as I said, and as I said, there is no simple e issue to the industrial and economic crisis. So, shortly, what do I mean by extravation and financialization of big groups? What I mean is that today we have to do with global firms and not just multinationals. And uh, the global firms has a link uh, with his previous industrial national basis, which is very weakened. weakened okay? Before it was very strong, but today it's not the case anymore. If you take the so-called national uh, groups in France. What is the part of the investment they realize in France? Depends. It's around 10%. Some of them 2% or 3%. So the relationship with the French industrial basis, which was before very strong, is today very weak. Huh? This is true for the American firms, but not in these proportions. But this is not absolutely true for German firms. German, fir German firms do invest mainly today in Germany or in countries around Germany. So the German firm firms remain multinational with a strong national link. And the American firms and mostly the French firms are global players. Do you understand the, the difference? Uh, the, the difference is uh, very huge. Their overseas investments are more and more important in the long run and is are more important than those made in their home economy, what it was before their home economy. The capital structure of this group is very open to global investors. So the idea that these firms lose their previous nationality Uh, seems to me uh, absolutely uh, verified. An inefficient industrial policy, what I said just for a couple of minutes, is that the industrial policy, especially in France, is centered or on individual groups. It means that the French state helps Peugeot, or has helped Peugeot, Alcatel, Renault, Usinor, and it doesn't support interactions among the productive systems. It means firm firm corporations, firm public laboratories, universities, and so on. Okay? And this is here a very big difference with the German industrial policy. The German industrial policy is a systemic policy supporting industrial links between firms, between firms and laboratories. Perhaps we'll go back on this point if we have the time. An outdated conception of work. And as I said before, the labor remains considered as a cost. And when you consider labor as a cost, of course, you reduce the cost because you want to have a higher productivity, a higher competitiveness. Huh? And not the labor is not considered as a contribution 
of individual and collective skills. So you see it is a matter of representation. What is labor exactly? Is it a cost? If you consider that as a cost, you have to reduce it. If you consider labor as something else than just a cost, a skill, for example, experiences, then of course you, you, you may see the thing in another way. Okay. And this obstacle, the when I mean obstacle, is a representation obstacle, huh? does not allow to shift uh, towards a new development model, but we will come back on this point shortly. Um, now, uh, what are the components? This is the last part. Uh, I have 10 minutes around. Okay. What could be the component of a productive part? <laughs> huh? I think this productive part is absolutely necessary to have a new development model. No? This is the, the idea. The general idea is uh, that European countries, but I stress European countries, but I'm sure it's true for countries which are not European, no? should engage a product in a program, in sort of development program, centered on productive uh, activities. And this program should be the backbone for an economic policy. This is my thesis. And I try now to, to identify a set of components of such a pact. So, first point, but I think it uh, should be clear in your minds if you have really understand what I try to explain. We have to have in mind another way to think what is labor. And uh, a la another labor design should be gradually, should gradually emerge. And uh, in relation to that, we should have another conception of what is competitiveness. Uh, and the idea, which is absolutely central for me, is you cannot say the firms have to innovate and at the same time, not recognize the skills of the persons who are working and just considering them as a labor cost which should be reduced. This is orthogonal. It doesn't work. Just well, what is the reason? Eh? The reason is very <coughs> simple. The, re the reason is that innovation is an interactive process between persons. And if the persons are just considered as a, as a labor cost, they are too expensive, why should these persons implement? Why should these persons use their skills to resolve new problems? Why should they do that? They don't do that. If you always re repeal that they are labor costs and you, they have, you have to, to reduce the labor costs, of course it doesn't work. So I mean that we have everywhere, and especially in Europe in our case, uh, to think about a new in historical industrial compromise. And this compromise is between companies that choose to focus on innovation and not just price and cost reductions, innovation, and employees, people working, who become cognitive or uh, cognitive is a French word, knowledge workers. This is, for me, the basis of a new historical compromise. Finance. You cannot leave finance. It's all the game. Finance must be made to serve more, more as they do. Eh? It's, uh, of course, uh, uh, well, another word in English. Finance must be made to serve more productivity uh, activities, what they don't do today. Uh, and here is a point very important, but uh, I have no time to explain it now, but we can go back on this point uh, in the discussion. Uh, so, uh, slide 13. Uh, we need temporal retardants to make finance again liquid. Today, finance is not liquid. Today, finance is volatile, and it's a very big difference between volatility and liquidity. 
to finance the industrial sector, we need the finance. We need banks, we need uh, financial markets, but on the general principle of liquidity and not volatility. And the difference between volatility and li liquidity is a speed difference. Today the finance is volatile, it means uh, it can move within the second. And this doesn't work. If we want to have a financial sector serving the industry, we have to reduce the speed of the finance to make it again liquid and not volatile. So we have to think about what could be the temporal retardance. And of course, here an example which is well known is the Tobin tax, typically. The Tobin tax is absolutely necessary to have an industrial development. It was not the idea of Tobin to do that, huh? but I, I buy the Tobin idea <laughs> in my field, considering that we need a temporal re retardance to have a, a liquid finance sector and not a volatile one. I think it's really important, and perhaps we will go back on this point, Production must be reoriented to address basic needs. I think this is very important. What is the meaning of the industry? Uh, of course, it is more or true less if you consider the situation of Greece, France, Germany. The situation is not uh, everywhere the same. But the idea generally is to reorient the production to, to, to meet the basic needs and to reduce the burden of productive activities on the nature. This is what we call here the ecological transition. Eh? So the ecological transition has to be linked with, with a reorientation of the production to meet the basic needs. Fourth, um, uh, the, here again it's, uh, it's a, a very important point, but, but uh, unfortunately uh, all points are rather important in my opinion. Uh, the firms should be recognized, and, and this is especially true for big firms, as full institutions, institutions. And I'm talking about enterprises. In our rights, it's not absolutely true in America, but in Europe, in our rights, we do not know what is an enterprise. We just know what is a society. If you take the right, French right, if you take the Italian right, Spanish right, and so on, and you look, enterprise, is there a right of the enterprises? You will find the right of the societies. But if you find the right of societies, you will just find the right of the actionaires, of the shareholders. So we have a lot of discussions about stakeholders but this discussion about stakeholders is a discussion without a right basis. It's a sort of hollow discussion because there is no basis, a right basis uh, for this discussion. The French right, for example, doesn't know the enterprise. The enterprise is a category in the statistic, in the economic statistic, but not in the right. So we are talking about, uh, about uh, a hollow uh, body which doesn't uh, really exist. Uh, what exists, which, uh, what is the institution existing? It is the society, and the society is not the enterprise. Well, again, we'll come back on this point if you wish. Uh, encoring activities has to go beyond simple locations. I've written uh, I think uh, uh, read a lot of things about this point, around 20 articles and uh, three books about this, this uh, very point, huh? uh, is to differentiate anchoring and location. We are just uh, talking about location. What are the location fact factors? How can I develop a policy to locate uh, industries or firms. And here you find land, building, institutions, uh, infrastructure, reducing costs and so on. But are we sure 
that these location factors are able to anchor activities in a territory? My answer, my personal answer is no. No, no. If we want to anchor activities and not just locate activities in a territory, here you need a triple proximity. But we'll come back and on this point if you need. A special proximity, a geographical if you prefer, a proximity. But it's not enough. Uh, if you have just a geographical uh, proximity, then you produce uh, economy external agglomeration, uh, agglomeration external uh, economies. Eco just, just that, what Marshall explains. It's not enough. So you need a geographical proximity, you need a, a proximity between actors uh, belonging uh, complementary assets. I can do something, my competencies are that, and you have other assets and we can work together. We are not only close geographically, we are close because our assets are complementary to resolve a problem. But is it enough that we are both on the same place and we have assets which are complementary to resolve a problem? Is it enough? The answer is clearly no. We can sit on the same uh, table, we can have complementary assets and do not cooperate. To cooperate we have to develop trust relations. Huh? So here you need three sorts of proximity geographically, uh, uh, proximity based on complementary assets, competencies, and trust or confidence. Okay, go back. Social norms are important. Financial norms, environmental norms. So we have to develop a sort of sets of norms to have uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this view, this representation possible. It's not a sort of protectionism. I, I, would, I would never uh, use this, uh, this word. And I don't see protectionism as a, a goal of in itself. But what we need is not exactly protectionism. We need to have protective standards. You, you cannot have this sort of uh, development program in head uh, without thinking that this program needs social norms, financial norms, and environmental norms. I'm almost finishing. We have to consider that industry is a common good. It was the beginning of uh, my speech. Huh? It's not only a private good when it works and a public good when, when it doesn't work. It is a common good. It means that the French industry belongs to the French population belongs to French people. It's not normal when a plant closes, uh, when a firm closes, that just the employees of the firms demonstrate to protect their jobs. It's not enough when just the people working around the firm demonstrate. When a firm closes, uh, the whole citizens, the whole city has to debate about the place of this industry or the place of uh, this enterprise for the city. It's much more important than just the employees uh, or the, uh, the firm itself. So I think we have to think about other ways than just letting public nationalization or private uh, uh, in initiatives. So the industry should be considered as a, German, as a common good and not uh, as a public or private good. I'm finishing. Economic policies uh, uh, must be based on this model and should focus on long-time strategy. And long-time strategy means the way to think about a new development uh, model. And you see here a very important point is I am using the world the concept development and not growth. I'm not looking for one point more growth or two points more growth. This is not the idea. The idea is another 
development. Uh, and I think that uh, a main problem uh, in the economic theory is the mass, the confusion between growth and development. And I think uh, we have to think about this point if you, if you want to go deep in, uh, in the theory and in the concept and be a, being a citizen, such questions, what are the differences between growth and development, such questions are extreme uh, important in my opinion. So I'm finishing. The industrial policies, I don't want to stress it again, eh? the industrial policies have to increase the density of interactions. Eh? I have already explained that. Instead, uh, supporting individual firms. And the last point, the firm should be at the heart of the city. It's not something, something outside the city, really at the heart of the city. And this implies a widening of the labor democracy. It's not only what is already very important to recognize the competencies, the skills of the persons who are working in order to have higher innovation processes. It's not only that, it, that would be just uh, shown very good. Huh? It's not only that, it's mo much more than that. It's what I call a labor democracy. It means that these persons should be involved in all strategic decisions of the firm, if you consider the firm as institution. Eh? Of course, if you do not consider the firm as an institution and you just recognize the society belonging to the shareholders, of course, this has absolutely no sense. But here, in my opinion, the firm, the enterprise, should be recognized as an institution. And if you recognize the enterprise as an institution, of course, the uh, uh, corollaire, uh, corollaire uh, proposition is to say that the people working inside the firm have to be involved in the strategic decisions and this is the labor democracy. So th this was uh, <laughs> the idea. So th thank you for your presentation. So we prepared some uh, a summary of the findings and then two main limits and then some questions for the audience. So to start with, since there's a lot of non-French people, I wanted to show a bit why the title was called Industrial Urgency. So I would like to start with this cover. <laughs> Can you guess who is the man on the cover? Why is he posing against a tricolor background with a cello shirt, clutching a French-made mixer and wearing a French watch? It's called Le Parisien. He's not the French GQ. And he's not some kind of French actor. Can you guess who he is? He's the Minister of the Economy and Industrial Recovery. So you can see how desperate we are in France for the minister to pose with French uh, goods to say that we should buy made in France. So your book is very much welcome in the context. So he was the, ministry the minister between 2012 and 2014. And now, uh, just for information, is a banker who is the minister. So no industrial recovery uh, minister anymore. So you didn't wait for the crisis to talk about manufacturing or industry. But let's say that at the same time as your book, some reports and other books were released with the title, uh, some titles such as um, Reindustrialization, I Write Your Name, French Must Choose, France without its factories. So it was a very fashionable topic. Okay, so now uh, the general assessments. So your big idea is that it's a proposal for a new growth model. Then you say it's more like a new development model. And I may even ask, is it a new mode of regulation? It's based on the new compromise between capital and labor. So your theoretical foundation are in heterodox industrial economics. So I think it's a very good synthesis and it's very interesting and refreshing because it goes against the established paradigm. Now, concretely in terms of policy, you correctly identify the need of uh, new European industrial policy. So on top of your slides, we had the white paper you wrote, 15 pages called an alternative for industrial policy. I think that you also uh, read this. But Alexandra is going to point it out what needs to be fleshed out in your proposal. So 
if I had to uh, give a subtitle to, to your presentation, I will call it In Search of Lost Industrial Policy. So first, what's my point? I think that you had some predecessors, some very eminent predecessors, but historically, industrial policy is totally absent from standard economic theory. So it's true that we had some theories talking about economic development and industrialization, just some names, Franz Litz, Gershon Kron, Hirschman, Myrdal, and so on and so forth. But we can say that industrial policy never really had a unified uh, theoretical framework, a unified corpus. Why? Because in standard economic theory, uh, you completely reject state intervention and you can only accom accommodate state intervention um, if there's misallocation of resources, and this is what we are learned to call market failure. So insofar as standard economics reject um, state intervention, they cannot think industrial policy. So some people in the 80s tried to give some vertical foundation to industrial policy, but what they did was simply to describe existing policies. So for instance, uh, you see on the left corner, uh, French uh, Revue d'économie industrielle, and it was a special issue on les politiques industrielles. But you had no real theoretical foundation. It was more describing what was going on in the 80s. Then in the 50s, you have a bunch of theoretical contribution uh, touching on industrial policy, but um, it was not the core of the concern. So now that we can claim that industrial policy is an applied domain without a theoretical status, uh, we can better enjoy your book and also appreciate where you are situated. So during the um, preparation of this presentation, we found, at least uh, for you in the Portuguese and English literature and for me in the French literature, hundreds of definitions of industrial policy. What does it mean? It means that industrial policy is a very ideological concept. If you cannot find any clear definition, you find 100 definitions, it means that it's ideological and it's very vital to recognize this as such if you want to raise the bar in the debate. Okay, this 100 definition, but we can put them between two extremes. So on the one hand, market failure, we already mentioned this, and on the other hand, and this is uh, Professor Scoletti's approach, um, industrial policy is based on competitiveness. We can discuss what competitiveness uh, means later. So it's an offensive vision of industrial policy. So there's a real will of the state of public intervention to push for competitiveness. While in the market failure, it's a very defensive vision of um, industrial policy. So we are very sympathetic to uh, your endeavor, especially in the current uh, in the current context. So as David Fleshy mentioned, you are in Toulouse, but you are not in Toulouse School of Economics. You are on the other side. So maybe it can be good to compare the two uh, paradigm. So you talk a lot about competitiveness, interaction, com complementarities. So it's a kind of synthesis of a <laughs> French productive system, for instance, Robert Boyer the, in the first class. Uh, for the Brazilian people or Nordic people, national system of innovation is also based on the idea of complementarities and interaction. And the idea and the general framework is uh, regulation. And this is opposed to Jean Tirole, who is very focused on optimal regulation, regulation policy, competition policy. He thinks in a framework where market failure justify set intervention. And his theory is based on the 80s theory of uh, incentives um, and contract. Okay, so of course today the dominant vision is the Tyrolean vision. So it's good to know that you didn't give up and you offer <laughs> 10 pages on the alternative for industrial policy in Europe. So a few words, just one minute, about industrial policy in Europe. So what was the past failure in industrial policy? Mainly the inconsistencies between the policies. Industrial policy didn't have a real role. It was a kind of the fifth wheel uh, of, the, of the car. So the superstar policy was competition policy, and it was kind of stuck between trade policy and competition policy. Uh, industrial policy was really the blind spot of policies uh, at the European level. 
and the consequences. I think you mentioned them enough for the French case, but also for the European case. The shrink of the industry from 45% uh, in uh, 1975 to 20% in 2010. Now, what are the current constraints? So the main one is the fiscal, uh, European fiscal compact. So we said that the offensive vision is yours uh, to push for competitiveness, but how does the EU understand competitiveness? Cost and price competitiveness. So it's very far from your vision of competitiveness. And of course, they're pushing forward uh, single market and uh, competition. But fortunately, you're not alone. You are in France, but there's also, for instance, people in Germany, the German um, Confederation of Unions, who have some uh, convergent vision. Um, there's also some eminent um, policymaker economists, Tiglitz, Mario Cimoli, Giovanni Dozzi, Mario Penta. So it's good to know that you're not alone. Having said that, we found your vertical foundation refreshing, your vision stimulating, but how convincing are you? So the floor is for Alexandra. So first, I just wanted to go through the, it was very clear in your presentation that you don't have, it's not a broad approach of, of industrial policy. It's actually a new model that you're thinking of. So I uh, just wanted to go through the fact that you consider macroeconomic policies and the impacts of financialization when you're analyzing what, ha what is happening for the industry. And you mentioned in your presentation how the overvalued um, euro in, the, in France had an impact on the industry. And I just wanted to link this with the presentation that we had last week with... I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you turn this on? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. So uh, we just I just wanted to, as I was saying, um, I just wanted to link this with a presentation that we had by Brese Pereira last week. And um, being from, I'm Brazilian, so we understand the impacts that macroeconomic policy can have on the industry as well, and for other commodity exporters in Latin America, and especially with the currency, um, and also that um, of financialization. Um, so I just want to talk, talk a bit about what is industrial policy. I mean, Lohan already talked about it, but um, if you're defining it, um, you hardly ever see the consideration of the interactions with micro macroeconomic policies and financialization as well. I mean, some authors have very specific um, definitions of policy, others have very broad definitions. So, for uh, example, the first one, um, it's funny because it's someone who critis uh, he is criticizing um, economic uh, industrial <coughs> policy. And he's talking about, he has a very wide, w broad definition. So if he has a broad definition, he can say, like, we shouldn't have state intervention. We shouldn't interfere in the economy. Um, and then what we have um, Chang, um, Hajun Chang, and he has a very specific view of policy. And he has, you have to target an industry. And it's, this is contraposing with the, your view of system and how the industry is a system and it's interacting. And um, what Lohan already had mentioned is the, the focus that you have on competition. So uh, we have we read the CEPAL paper, and it has different um, policies and instruments that you can use. But the at the end, it's basically instruments that are focused on competition and how to make your industry comp more competitive without actually changing the system itself. So. I hope you can read this. Um, these are the seven main points that you highlighted in your paper. It wasn't exactly like that in the presentation, but there are seven main points. Um, and it's, so I'm just gonna read them really quickly. So industrial policy as a system, um, recognizing workers inside, so a change between the, uh, the role that workers have inside the, the firm. Um, democracy in the workplace, um, have making the workers have more of a say um, compared to the, the people who are the, the capital, the capitalists, um, I mean, <laughs> but um, definancialization strategies in the long term, anchoring activities to the national, um, and a country, the home economy, um, with the aspects of protecting nature and um, protective standards, which you <coughs> call is how we maintain the system working. Um, and you talk about different instruments that we can use. You talk about um, public investment, um, promo promoting investment, um, education, uh, macroeconomic policies. And what I really wanted to talk about is how 
do we get the firms to recognize the workers? I mean, we have various instruments, but for me, um, I wanted to talk about how, you talked about, um, let's say, um, having s workers that are more skilled, but still, um, how do we get the firms to make the change mm -hmm. and recognize them? Um, so what are the instruments for that? And then this is, you were talking about the new development model. Um, the new governance model is, I added it, it's not in the paper. Uh, you talk about changing the governance structure within the firm to level out what the, what the role that workers have compared to the uh, people who are, for, um, let's say, the shareholders. Um, and for me, I called it a new governance model because you change the way the, the firm relates to the capital, uh, the labor capital relations. So it's a structural change. And while you're all saying, also changing the relationship between the financial sphere and the productive sphere by trying to remove or definancialize the economy or the, the industry. And while you're also in trying to anchoring, you're trying to anchor it, so you're trying to um, <coughs> create the links between the home economy and the industry, so um, how it's influenced by globalization and how you don't you don't have the same interests for a company that you have for a country and how to bring them back together. Um, so this is for me, I call it a new governance model um, um, because it's it changes the whole way the the industry it, it works right now. And what I wanted to ask you is, um, so where do you see the change coming from? Should we focus on recognizing the workers? Should we focus on definancialization strategies? Do we anchor first? Do we attack from three fronts? Mm -hmm. um, and my, con <laughs> my concern is because if you start from one point or you start more from one point, you actually can have what I'm calling unforeseen effects. So you think you'll arrive by recognizing workers, you'll be able to anchor them, mm -hmm. but um, may have a different effect. So we have the, you compared a lot with the German example, but we may not actually arrive at the same example because it is such a complex interaction. And how do you keep that from happening and coming to a model that's close to this? Mm -hmm. which which I am totally, I agree with, and I would like to see this model, but um, I'm just preoccupied, um, worried about um, how do we change it? How do we co come arrive at this new development model? And um, because at the end of the day, it, it has to be a, f a change that happens within the firms. Mm -hmm. So you can influence the firms, mm -hmm. but um, how do you get them to change the way that you want to? I mean, it's a complex system, but just to discuss it. And um, for example, just on the definancialization aspect, you mentioned um, um, how we could, um, you need to uh, reduce the mobility to reduce the volatility of capital. Um, and uh, so, if, and I'm asking is <coughs> international cooperation needed? Can we do this by ourselves? I mean, uh, if you do it only for Europe or even only for France, will it not have an unforeseen effect and uh, we will end up in a different model than the one that we want? So now I want to specifically focus on the new labor capital nexus. So this, what is really at the heart of your contribution is to highlight this new labor capital nexus. So first, let's say that in contrast to most heterodox economists, you don't put financialization at the core of your proposal. Mm -hmm. So for you, financial regulation is n it's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. So that's make you a heterodox among the heterodox. Um, okay. So it also means that for you, we are in a situation right now where there's no, there's not a new mode of regulation since Fordism. So we are waiting for a new successor, new heir of Fordism. And you suggest something that is based on the figure of the cognitive worker. My remark is that, okay, you assume your normative position, you mentioned it at the beginning of your speech, you assume your normative position, but if you want to be <coughs> convincing, when you talk about the existence of the, I mean, when you talk about the cognitive worker, you need to flesh it out. So, for instance, 
um, you need maybe to build scientific tools, maybe new statistics, to identify the figure of the cognitive worker. Because right now, what people can tell you is there's no, um, it's not true that competencies, skills, know-how are the heart of the model. Maybe it's even neo Taylorian uh, labor organization. So we need, as scientists, to go a bit beyond this normative position and to show that there's something there if you want to make it happen. Okay, another idea is also that you, you put a big emphasis on the workplace. You said democracy at the workplace, it's a relevant level of analysis, and it's also the strategic level for the struggle. I think that there are at least three empirical, two empirical facts that can very undermine your, uh, your strategy. So if I reformulate your strategy, is to rebuild the notion of the firm, of the entreprise, in order to make it the central site uh, of the respons responsibility of the employer mm -hmm. and by implication of decision maker. Mm -hmm. So you really want to rebuild and build the notion of entreprise. Um, but I think that your implicit assumption is that there's an identity between the firm as the unit of production, as a productive organization, the firm as an employer, the model of labor contract under the same legal status, and the firm as the site of decision to allocate capital. But we all know from empirical fact that there's, for instance, this junction between the firm as the employer and the firm as a unit of production. In the same workplace, you can have people under several labor contracts and employed by different employer. A second disjunction uh, with globalization, whatever uh, the name you want to use, there's a disjunction between uh, the firm as a decision center to allocate capital, mm -hmm. that would be the holding, and the firm as a unit of production, the subsidiaries. So, so how can we how can we go how can we go about it? So the changing boundaries of the firm raise the question, what is the most efficient level for workers to intervene in the firm? Mm -hmm. And if we draw the implication uh, from what I mentioned at these two disjunctions, maybe we, maybe we have to think of new sites and new actors to defend labor. So I think that's, um, that's the, main, the main issue. So even if we are sympathetic with your vision, mm -hmm. maybe you're focused on the firm, it's a bit... Um, you're not the only one, but maybe it's a bit 80s, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, cooperative and so on. And maybe this doesn't go well with uh, globalized and not only financial capitalism, but also globalized capitalism. So do you have a question with the comments and comments? Yeah. Uh, it's okay, do you have a question or should do you, want do you want to ask me? Yeah, we just wanted to, um, you mentioned on your in your presentation as well that um, the industry as a common good and the industry as a shared, um, should be shared within the, in the, the, the society because of the impact it has on the economy. Um, and we just wanted, we, when we were reading your paper, we, we kind of got confused, not confused, I mean, it was it w on the concept of commons, which was, yeah, was yeah. presented by Kohia. Yeah. Very uh, clear. What are you talking about? What has to be preserved? Industry as a concept, a specific factory, mm -hmm. a firm, what is to be preserved? Mm -hmm. And you talk about common good, that would be not private, not public, but what it is. And now it's very fashionable in a French debate. You have Benjamin Corrier with his theory of commons, and you have uh, Dardo Level with Le Commun. So mm -hmm. how do you situate yourself? So, um, so first of all, I would like really to uh, thank you very much uh, for the work you have done, which is uh, really very uh, uh, sensitive, uh, very uh, intelligent, and for me, very useful, uh, because uh, um, um, talking with you uh, is, uh, for me, a possibility to progress. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not natural at all, and I have... Uh, written a lot of things, uh, what you have said, and uh, these are tools for me uh, in order to go on uh, and to try to, to be more precise and to, to continue the work uh, I've, um, 
already started uh, a long time ago. So thank you really very much for, for that. And I would like very much to, to stay in relation with you in order to, <coughs> to try to work together if you agree with that. So thank you really very much. Um, I will try to, to give you some, some answers. I, I could uh, answer you within two hours or <laughs> three hours. Uh, uh, we, we do not have this time. Uh, and uh, another uh, mm, difficulty is that we talk in English. And these problems are so um, complex uh, that uh, the best solution would be that uh, each one of us uh, uses his own language uh, and the other ones are able to understand and to answer in their own language. <laughs> but uh, in English, uh, it's a source of, of handicap uh, in some sense. Huh? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to say that um, all positions of social scientists are always normative. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, because uh, uh, sometimes um, uh, some people say uh, uh, you are completely normative. You, you, are, you are giving a, a special representation. You, are, you, are, you have your, your own definitions and so on. But I think, of course, I assume that. But I would like to know who is uh, the economist who is absolutely positive. I mean, not normative. There are um, uh, two categories of, um, of economists and social scientists. The one who are absolutely sure uh, that uh, uh, they have uh, understand uh, what is uh, the economic theory uh, and uh, this theory uh, is the truth uh, and uh, they uh, just uh, say the truth. They are doing, uh, uh, they are producing the good economy and the people who are not, who do not agree with them are ideological. I think just on the contrary, <laughs> they are ideologists. They do not assume that they are normative also. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think I'm not, uh, um, I'm an economist. Uh, they are economists uh, and we have to agree on one point, which is uh, in my opinion very important, that there is a huge diversity. Uh, and uh, the idea was, as we have built the Association Française d'Economie Politique. There is an, a French uh, association, um, uh, Economie Politique, uh, was not to, to replace uh, the, uh, the neoliberal paradigm with another one. The idea was just to say, we need to debate. And there is no one theory what's right and the other one are ideological. Uh, they are not permitted objects and forbidden objects. There is no one method with right econometry, for example, and the other one uh, are good for uh, sociologists but not for economists. So there is a diversity of uh, theories, of uh, approaches, uh, of uh, tools, uh, materials, uh, and so on. So, of course, my definitions, my definitions or my definition is normative as all of them are normative. And I assume my uh, normativity. And I just see that the other ones think that they have the truth uh, uh, given from God. And this is uh, today uh, true for uh, neoliberals. But if you think uh, the um, uh, past century or even the century before, a lot of economists uh, thought that they discover the uh, rules of the economy, uh, the, the rules of the economy. Marx was absolutely convinced uh, that uh, the la uh, best tendance du taux de profit, I don't know how to say it in, in English, uh, the, the thing that the, the profit rate decreases, uh, was, was or is a rule of uh, economy. So the idea was that uh, there are some immanent rules uh, of the economy and the job of the economist is to find them. In my opinion, there is no immanent uh, good and the job of the economist is not to discover immanent rules. So I don't try to discover immanent rules. I just try to understand what are the compromises we, we need. Uh, and 
this is uh, the only job I do, and uh, and I try to do this uh, this job, uh, and uh, I'm not alone to do this uh, person. Um, well, this was the the first point. You have absolutely right when you when you uh, when you are when you try to explain something, you have to try to explain your point of view. You have to um, to insert your point your point of view in a paradigm, in general paradigm. I didn't do that. You, you are absolutely right. Uh, uh, and my my general paradigm is the paradigm of the regulation theory. It's very clear. I'm a member of uh, the regulation uh, theory, and um, I have uh, um, a lot of discussions with uh, my colleagues uh, of the regulation theory uh, uh, approach. Um, my main disappoint, uh, my main um, disaccord, uh, disappoint, disagreement. disagreement uh, my main disagreement with uh, my my colleagues of uh, regulation theory is absolutely the point you have pointed out is uh, the hierarchy or not the hierarchy of the institutional uh, um, compromises. Um, as you may know, perhaps, I, I don't know if you know the, the re regulation theories. It's, 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 it's impossible to, to, to explain it now. If I explain it at the time, it would be over <laughs> without any uh, further debate. Uh, the, the, the one, one main question is there are five, five, regulation, five uh, uh, compromises, uh, institutional forms. Uh, uh, is there a hierarchy or not? Is there a complementarity between the institutional forms? And in general, the discussion is uh, uh, structured uh, as the following. Uh, the, 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 the main part of my colleagues uh, consider that there is a hierarchy. Uh, some of them consider there is no hierarchy. There is just a complementarity. And this is the position of uh, Bruno Amable, for example, there is just a complementarity, and the complementarity of the institutional forms is not the same in uh, Europe, uh, in America, uh, and so on. But there is a complementarity. But the main uh, economists of this approach consider there is a hierarchy, and here the main point is that they consider that the hierarchy depends on the regulations modus. It means when you have a special regulation modus, then you have a special hierarchy. It means in the Fordism, as a regulation modus, uh, uh, the main institutional form is uh, the labor capital nexus. And they consider that we are not anymore in Fordism, but we are something between post for dims and a new uh, regulation modus and they consider for some of them that the main uh, institutional form is the uh, financial form and monetary form and some of them consider that the main form is the concurrence uh, the, the competition. Competi competition and if uh, Pascal Petit would have been there today, he would uh, have stressed uh, that uh, the competition forms us the, the more uh, important. This is not at all my opinion. <laughs> my opinion is uh, that uh, there is a hierarchy uh, between the institutional forms, but uh, the hierarchy remains always the same, but the heart of each institutional form changes. This is my position. It means, to be more precise, that I consider that the labor capital nexus plays always the main role, is at the top of the hierarchy, but the heart of this uh, capital, uh, uh, capital and uh, work, um, labor capital, compromises changes. It means uh, that at the time of the Fordism and Taylorism, the compromise was 
how to produce and how to share the productivity surplus. It was so hard. The answer was Taylorism for the production of uh, uh, productivity uh, surpluses and um, Forbism and Keynesianism were the ways to distribute uh, the productivity surpluses. If you, do you understand what I, what I say? Huh? It was the, the core of, the, uh, of this uh, compromise. Compromise was how do we manage to get productivity surplus and how do we distribute them? Okay? And it has, it has worked huh, without any, uh, any doubt. Now I think this compromise is over for a lot of reasons. Uh, I'm not able to, to, to explain in two minutes. This compromise is over, so we shouldn't try to, uh, to have a survival of this compromise. We have to think another compromise, but again, the compromise between capital and labor remains the main one, but the type of the compromise cannot be the same when the Fordism is dead. We have to find another one. And the compromise I suggest is that the firms do innovate instead trying to have productivity surpluses. So you see there is a move according to the firms. And according to the employees, the main goal is not to achieve a higher productivity. The main goal is to be creative to support interactive processes. This is the, the core of the compromise. And uh, this core of the compromise is not uh, explained in the book uh, L'Urgence Industrielle. Because if you write a book, uh, you cannot write a total book. It doesn't exist. Uh, well, I'm not Keynes, and uh, I didn't write the Théorie Générale, the general theory. But I try to be um, organized in my way of working and thinking, and I'm writing books with specific objects. Um, the object you mentioned is what is uh, a cognitive worker, what are the characteristics of uh, uh, an, uh, um, a collective um, cognitive uh, work has been defined in another book. <laughs> Uh, the book is, uh, has for title les, new, les, les Nouveaux Horizons du Capitalisme, The New Horizons of Capitalism. And this book, Les Nouveaux Horizons du Capitalisme, has been published in 2008. Uh, and uh, because this uh, topic is uh, very complex, uh, I have coordinated this book. And this book has been written by 10 uh, researchers which are uh, economists, but not only uh, economists, is to try to define what is a collective, uh, what is a connective worker uh, at the individual uh, step or a collective step. The, the main idea is uh, that, um, that the workers today, the employees, do not um, uh, work in routine situations, they have to face uh, uncertainty. Uh, they have to face, to face uh, everyday new problems. And the problems, they have first to be formalized. They have to understand the problems. And uh, uh, they have to solve the problems using their uh, complementarities. Uh, their experiences, uh, their way of uh, thinking, their own qualification, and, and so on. So, and we have produced a sort of general table uh, explaining exactly which are the characteristics of a Taylorist worker, which are the characteristics of a neo Taylorist, neo -Taylorist workers, and which are the characteristics of uh, uh, cognitive uh, workers. If I had a little bit of time, I would uh, show you that in a table. But I uh, do not have this time, or we, 
we, we, do, we cannot uh, debate. But I'm, uh, I will send you uh, this, uh, this uh, table and this uh, chapter with great pleasure. And then you can, if you want, uh, uh, send it to share it with, uh, with everyone. OK. So this is uh, one part of uh, the answers I would like to give you. Uh, OK. Um, the um, way of thinking of uh, Tyrol, Tyrol is, uh, is, of course, a neoliberal. Uh, um, is uh, trying to find the uh, micro foundations of macro uh, macro uh, macro representation of what is uh, economy. Uh, he is in, in in really indeed he is a, a neoliberal because uh, his position is always um, inspired of uh, individualism, methodologic, methodological uh, individualism. So he always writes about the producer and never about the producers. He always, uh, uh, he's always thinking about the le consommateur and never about les consommateurs. So he tries to go from the macro level to the macro level. My position about this uh, very uh, epistemologic question uh, is that the, um, there is, of course, a micro level and macro level. But the level uh, which, is for which, which is for me the most important is the intermediate level, the mesoeconomic level. Meso -economic level. And the definition uh, I'm using for the industrial policy is typically a meso uh, uh, analysis definition. My definition is, it's very difficult to, to say it in English, uh, the, uh, the, the goal of the industrial policy should be to manage the dialectic of the interdependencies inside the productive system. Did you understand? Uh, it's a way to manage the dialectic of interdependencies inside the productive system. This is typical a uh, meso-analytic uh, um, approach of what is an industrial policy. If you consider the considerations of uh, Tyrol, uh, they are micro considerations or market failure, macro. There is nothing between micro and macro. And my position is exactly what is between micro and macro. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the question uh, you asked Chris, how uh, is it possible to, um, to transform um, my, norm, my normative uh, representations uh, into uh, something more real, more concrete, uh, is of course uh, a very central question. And here I have developed uh, with other colleagues a sort of model, and I will send you this model. But to be very short, there are in our uh, uh, point of view, according to this uh, methodological model, uh, three levels. You have the level, the very, um, the very aggregate level of representations. When we talk about representations, we are talking about the, we, the, the views we have, what is the world, what should be the world. For example, I say you, work is not a cost, but is competencies, skills, and so on. And the other one answer, no, I don't agree. Labor is a cost. And I can substitute at any time labor through capital, productive capital. When we are talking like that, we are talking on a level which is very aggregated. This is the representation level. 
And it's very difficult to, um, to go out of that because it's theory against theory. I have a theoretical representation, you have another one, and we disagree. Okay? It's impossible to, to, uh, to go uh, further because we just uh, observe that we disagree on our uh, epistemological uh, basis. We, do, we disagree. For a Keynesian, it's very difficult to, to, to have a discussion with a neoliberal because the uh, uh, epistem uh, epistemological uh, basis is not at all the same. So you may have two uh, uh, point of views, approaches, which are absolutely uh, in, another, uh, in another world, in another level. So th there is no discussion, there is no debate. So in our methodology tool, tool we have this very, um, uh, very high level, very aggregated, what we call representations. And then you have at the um, uh, basis of the model what we call the norms. But not the norms as general representations as uh, uh, the institutionalists uh, generally consider but the norms in the old day life. What does it mean, uh, the norms in the old day life? Is, for example, the indicators. The indicators, the economic indicators, okay? Or the indicators in the university. How do you here measure uh, the uh, uh, performance of this university? What are the indicators to say this university is, uh, is performant or is not performant. You, you will develop some norms to say, okay, these are the norms. Uh, a firm is performant, for example, for example, uh, a firm is performant uh, when uh, the profit of the firm is high or the, perf the profit of the firm related to uh, own capital and, and so on. You develop some indicators. You can try to change the indicators. It's very difficult uh, because the indicators are very heavy. Eh? In uh, accountability, for example, the indicators are very heavy. It's very difficult to, to, to move them. Uh, you can change, for example, the way you evaluate the performance of researchers. And you can say, today, to measure the, uh, the performance of the researchers, we just count how many articles uh, this uh, uh, these um, researchers are producing each year. But it's very difficult to change the norm. It's extremely difficult to change the norm. You have to fight for years to try to move a little bit the norm. You have to fight years to try to have a review what was not in the perimeter of the uh, so-called representative uh, reviews uh, inside the perimeter. So you really it's a fight uh, without, uh, without an end. So you see, it's really difficult. Uh, the discussion uh, on the level of representation is very difficult. It's representation against the other one. The norms are very uh, inert. Uh, it's difficult to, to move them. But uh, the m in the methodological tool we have developed with other uh, colleagues working uh, in linguistic uh, and information systems is that there is a sort of third level, and this level is between the representations and the norms. And this level is the level of the principles. What are the principles? What are the principles uh, uh, to consider new norms for firms? What are the principles if you want to operate in another way in university? What, what, what does it mean, principles? But the principles are a sort of machines to produce the norms. And this principle level is, necessarily, is necessary to articulate the representation, representation level and the norm level. You need something in between. And you, what you need in between is exactly the, the principles. So today, I am exactly working on this level principles 
to try to articulate the representation level and the norm level. Okay, if we would have time, after, perhaps we will have time, I don't know, I, I could uh, show you how does it work if we consider, for example, what is a firm? You can answer to this question, what, I what is the firm? Getting this question on the representation level, on the norm level, or in the, in the principal level. If we have time, I will show you that. If we don't have time, I, will, I won't show you that. Okay. Um, to finish, uh, to try to, uh, to uh, answer the last um, remark or question, industry, in my opinion, is a common good. It's not a common, it's a common good. Nature is a common. But industry is a common good, and I use the word good to say it has been produced by human beings. It is a good produced by uh, by human beings. The nature has not been has not been produced by by um, by uh, by the people. No? Now, if I consider the industry as a common good, uh, what is uh, uh, the form of this common good? Uh, at the micro level. The form is of course the firm, is clear, but not any form of firm. The firm can be uh, a cooperative firm, of course, uh, it's very concrete, eh? a cooperative firm, but it could be a conventional firm too, a standard firm, but if it is a standard firm, you have to definitionalize this firm. It means the firm cannot be considered as a liquid asset having for only goal to produce value for the shareholders. If you keep this um, representation, then it's of course absolutely impossible to see the firm the conventional firm as the concrete form of a common this is of a common good it's impossible so you have to definitionalize uh, the firm and the question is how do you definitionalize the firm and this question is both a micro question and a macro question the answer is not the same at the macro level and at the micro level at the macro level, I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit long, huh, the answer. Um, at the macro level, the only way is, again, to work about the principles. And here, you have two principles which are important. Two principles at the macro level to differentialize the way firms are working. The first principle is to... Um, restrain the very huge difference, difference it exists between the speed of mobility between factors. Today you have to do not with two factors but with four factors. Before we were always talking about capital and labor. I think this way to think the new uh, configuration is too short. We should consider instead two fo factors, four factors, the financial capital, the productive capital, workers or employees whose competencies are recognized, and the other employees. And what we see today is that the speed of mobility of these four factors is extreme different. The financial capital is volatile, as I said. It, it moves uh, within the second. The productive capital and the workers or employees whose competencies are recognized are mobile and not volatile. If you, of course, if you invest in China, you do need two or three years to realize your investment. Uh, if an engineer moves, uh, he needs one year, two years to prepare uh, his movement 
And if he goes back, he will need two or three years in order to, to go back and to prepare his return. So these factors are mobile, they are nomadic, but not volatile. And the last factor, I mean the um, workers or employees whose competen competencies are rot not recognized, they do are mobile, but the, their mobility is extreme under pressure. If they move, they will move in very bad conditions, in precarious precar conditions. And instead of moving, the firms say, stay where, they are, where, where you are, we move the productive capital. The French firms or German firms do not go today in North Africa or in the Turkey uh, to uh, get people uh, coming to France or Germany to work in France or in Germany. They move the productive uh, capital. So you see, uh, you have a sort of, um, how to say that, a scale, a very open scale of mobilities. And our assumption is uh, that the distribution of revenues uh, is extremely strong related to the mobility. It means that the first uh, factor uh, who has to uh, be um, retributed is the, the factor whose mobility is the highest. And in this case, of course, the financial capital. When the financial capital has been retributed, then comes the turn of the mobile uh, workers, uh, whose competencies are recognized, and the productive uh, capital. They come at the second place. I hope you understand what I, what I mean. And you can see uh, that the revenues of financial capital is indeed the highest one. And then the economic return and not the financial return, the economic return of the firms is today around 7-8% a year. The financial return is about 15-18%. So you see the scale. And the engineers are able to negotiate uh, today their uh, retribution who are not able to negotiate anything. The last uh, factors, because the mobility of this factor is, as I said, extreme under pressure. So the two principles, I'm talking about principles, uh, is the first one uh, a very um, open scale um, of uh, mobility of the, factor, of, of the factors four or five factors, and revenues distributed in function of this uh, mobility. So if you want to definancialize uh, the way uh, the macro system works, you have to attack these two principles. If you just attack the representation or the norms, you, you won't be able to do anything. You have to attack the principles. It means you have to find the way how to reduce the scale uh, of mobility. It means to be more concrete, you have to uh, import to, to develop uh, temporal uh, retardants, as I explained. Huh? I gave you the example of uh, the Tobin tax. But you have, on the other hand, to increase the mobility of uh, uh, the workers of the employees and the only way the only way to increase uh, mobility is to substitute the uh, physical mobility by a mobility based on competencies it means that the people are able to move from a project to another project because uh, they are able to develop methods uh, to develop competencies uh, which uh, make them able uh, to jump from a project to another project. The physical mobility for uh, an employee or for a worker is the worst one thinkable. 
the good mobility is a professional mobility and not the, geog geographical, mobi uh, the geographical mobility. The second uh, principle is, of course, is to decorrelate uh, the mobility with uh, the uh, distribution of, uh, of income. Today is extreme correlated, is to decorrelate it. So we have tried uh, with uh, two uh, colleagues who are mathematicians and another colleague uh, who is economist uh, to develop an econometric model uh, to show that, uh, to show how it works and how it should work to go out of this uh, situation. And uh, I hope it will be published in the, in, the next, uh, in the next weeks. But it's very difficult because we try to publish this uh, article uh, in standard uh, reviews. And I'm very much afraid uh, that uh, they will consider that uh, this is not an uh, article in economics. <laughs> okay. So okay. Do you understand uh, my position? Huh? Okay. So, questions? Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I just would like to, if you could talk a little bit more about your experience in the Greek government and the relations you have with them, because uh, the, the main question is uh, what you see, what you, what you think are the limits and possibilities that uh, uh, to undertake an industrial policy in a context of austerity policies and macroeconomic restrictions. So what the Greek experience uh, could uh, shed light on this particular question. Uh, how are the, what are the possibilities and limits on doing that? Hi, um, I want to make you two questions. The first one is that when you compare the, the, the situation in France and Germany and the US, you, you talk about a uh, high tech sector, medium tech sector, but my question is if you have a kind of measure of the productivity of, of each country. And the second one is um, if you have an answer of why uh, it's like, German firms remain German because this idea of they remain in German or nearby and not uh, want to turn our places. Anyone else? Hi, I had a question that's been coming up in a lot of these seminars, um, and you sort of touched on it, but we're kind of rushing at the end. But the idea of um, ecological sustainability within this new industrial model, that seems to be really the big thing that's going to be coming up in the next 50, 60 years, particularly for our generation. And it, it's been frustrating in some senses of how even a lot of heterodox economists haven't really been able to put that front and center as one of the main things we've been, that we'll have to deal with. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit. It sounded like when you were talking about the difference between growth and development, that you had that in mind. Um, but I was wondering how, I guess, how much more there is to that and how well developed there is and to what extent that is a place that we need to do more work in trying to connect things like post-Keynesian economics and regulationist economics with the growing field of environmental or ecological economics. Okay, so first of all, thank you for your presentation. It raised a lot of points for me. Um, okay, so I've read a lot of articles on the national innovation system approach. So, of course, I'm in favor of um, focusing on interaction instead of focusing only on firms, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, I've been uh, reading articles about uh, picking the winner's policies which, if I'm not mistaken, can mean two things. Either you can focus on a sector or you can focus on particular firms. And uh, so my question is, 
can we conciliate the interactions approach with picking the winners uh, policies? I mean, can we conciliate interactions, uh, the interactions approach with picking a, a winner company? Um, does it uh, ha has it been done already in any country? For example, uh, does the German government help in any way Volk Volkswagen? Uh, and if it does, does it pay attention to reinforcing interactions between Volkswagen and other smaller companies? And uh, or uh, I don't know, are, are picking the winner policies good at all? I don't know because I'm not an expert. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question uh, relates to protectionism, because in your presentation you said uh, you kind of distanced yourself a little bit from protectionism and then you preferred the term product, uh, protective standards or something like this. Um, and I was wondering whether uh, this process of de-industrialization in economies that are part of free trade agreements is really so much uh, a matter of wrong policies or whether they are rather pushed into these sectors by by the um, division of labor in the global economy. And um, so I, I was wondering whether you can still be part of free trade agreements and try to avoid protectionism and at the same time do something against this um, development of, of deindustrialization, which might not be the result of a deliberate policy decision, but really something that the market that the market pushes you into into some sectors uh, where you have uh, comparative advantages. One more question. Thanks, Gabriel. I, th I think it was really, really useful to have this discussion and this debate. Uh, my question is, uh, okay, you believe there is a hierarchy in the institutional forms. Maybe you believe, uh, you said that each of the 10 points of your pact for industry is important, so maybe there is also a hierarchy. And I wanted to know, maybe you could elaborate, but I know it's very long to do so, but uh, probably the hierarchy in those 10 points is not the same, for instance, in France and in Greece. So could you maybe say, a few words about the situation in Greece where the industry is really weak and uh, what would you advise now, what are you advising now to the government in order to re-industrialize uh, uh, Greece? <laughs> so, um, so, again, th thank you very much for all your questions. And they are all, uh, I think, uh, pertinent. Huh? So, uh, if you allow me to say that, uh, they are pertinent. I, I don't see any question which uh, is really not considered as important. Uh, each question is really uh, very important. So, uh, I'll try to to give you some some elements, uh, but we, we would need, I think, uh, uh, a long time to discuss uh, uh, each question that's really important. Um, I will begin with the first and last question uh, according to, to, to Greece. Uh, the, the crisis in Greece is as well uh, an uh, European uh, crisis uh, and a Greek crisis. Um, I have uh, published a book um, in my 2014 uh, in Athens. Um, about the crisis in Greece and issues. Uh, this book has been written in French, um, not to be published in France, it was not my aim. Uh, the aim was to publish this book in, uh, in Greece. I will probably one day publish this book <laughs> in France, uh, but uh, it was not my aim and uh, I try when I have an aim to, to, to follow only this aim and not other ones. Um, I think that uh, there are uh, specific problems in, in Greece uh, and it means uh, that uh, uh, certain solutions um, 
have to be uh, colored uh, with Greek uh, colors. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, in, in Greece, um, a particular um, par parallelism uh, between the weakness uh, of the economy and of the industry, on one hand, and the weakness of the institutions, uh, on the other hand. Uh, for me, it's amazing to see uh, that uh, you cannot uh, explain the weakness of the Greek uh, economy uh, and industry in particular if you do not have in mind the weakness of the institutions. Uh, and the weakness of the institutions uh, is not only the weakness of the state, uh, it's the weakness of all institutions uh, which are producing the values and the norms in the Greek uh, society. I just would like to give you one example. Uh, is, um, I, have, I was amazed to see uh, that uh, the agriculture balance uh, is uh, negative in Greece. I was convinced on the contrary, uh, but Greece imports more uh, agriculture uh, products and agro-agriculture products than it exports. And uh, to understand that, uh, you have to, to have um, an, an analysis uh, distinguishing volume and prices. It's very important. Huh? And if you do that, uh, you, you will see that uh, Greece, for example, exports olives and imports oil, olive and oil. It's typically what should, should not be done, of course, because you lose by the terms of the exchange. You export a cheap good and import uh, an expensive one. If you just say as an, you say as an economist, you consider that, you know, what are the solutions you are going to say? You are, you are going to say uh, Greece should import, uh, should, should uh, invest, uh, things like that. But if you try to, to, to show the institutional pro problem, which is very much correlated to the economic one, then you will see that it was not the case for 10 years, it is the case today. Why? Because the cooperative system has uh, the mechanical tools to uh, get out the olives, the oil, which is needed. I don't know, but the, 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 the way to, to press the olives and to get the oil. This is not uh, uh, um, the property of each um, Greek um, uh, agriculteur. It is the property of the cooperative. And uh, the cooperative system worked out very well for 10 years. But after the time, the cooperative system, instead of being c focused on the way the the, the, the the, this mechanical system works, uh, has changed his mission and was transformed, trans was transformed into a sort of bureaus distributing the subventions of in uh, the European agriculture uh, policy. And these uh, structures has, have, bec has be have become, become uh, clientelistes. So you have uh, absolutely, I give you that as an example to understand uh, that uh, you have uh, as social scientist to develop an analysis putting uh, as a corollaire, uh, a parallel corollaire, uh, both, both uh, analysis, an economic one and an institutional one. So, it's exactly what I've tried with the Greek uh, government. Uh, I have tried to, to tell them you have to have uh, an economic program and you have to have the institutional setting for this uh, uh, economic program. It's not just economic problems. Uh, these are two 
institutional uh, problems. The debt, for example, uh, I take this example, the public debt. What is the public debt? Is the public debt a financial problem or is it an economic and social problem? If you are not able to answer clearly to this question, the proposal you are going to have will be confusing. In my opinion, at the contrary of the vision of Mr. Varoufakis, the previous uh, Minister for Financing, in my opinion, in my representation, to be more precise, the debt is not a financial problem. The debt is an economic, social, institutional problem. And the consequences of uh, uh, this both ways to represent what is the debt are extremely important and the representations lead to very different proposals. I give you just an example and I close afterward the, the, the answer for this question. Mr. Varoufakis has suggested to have a, um, a perpetual debt, to rule the debt as a perpetual problem. And as we are talking about uh, at, the, uh, no at noon uh, during the lunch, if you see the debt like that, it means that you have a perpetual debt with perpetual interests. With perpetual interest. And it means perpetual interest is that you, you have a very big responsibility for the next generations. Huh? The, the next generation is will have to pay perpetual interest on this debt. 25% of GDP, right? Come on. 25%, 20, 25 of public expenditures, the interest. The interest is, uh, is uh, you understand uh, what it means. Huh? The proposal we have done with two other colleagues, one economist and one lawyer, is to convert the debt into investment certificates. This is a typical neo-Keynesian way of thinking the debt, to convert the debt into investment certificates. I have no time to explain you now technical how it works. I've explained it in several papers. It has been published by Le Monde Diplomatique uh, in France uh, last uh, July. But this way to think the debt is completely uh, different. And the institutional setting is completely different too. So my general answer, if I may answer like that, very general, is always to think the link between economic problems, economic solutions, and the institutional uh, setting. Unfortunately, I can go, uh, it's impossible to go uh, further. I would like very much, but um, it's difficult. Um, if I try to compare uh, countries, um, I'm not sure that the standard comparison uh, between productivity level uh, is uh, the, the right one. Uh, the focus of, on the productivity is typical for uh, um, a Keynesian uh, and for this approach. Um, in, th in, th in, the in the new world uh, we would like to live in, uh, in the very next uh, future, this is not a problem. The problem is not uh, if uh, the productivity is high or not high because the productivity problem is a typical optimization problem. You have uh, factors and you try to optimize them. But our way of thinking, I say our because I'm not alone, eh, uh, is not to optimize existing resources. Our way is to create new resources or identify latent resources. This is the way to think development and not to think the growth. The growth has always to do with how do I optimize existing resources. The, not the growth, but the development question, problematic, is a completely other one. Is how do I create new resources? How do I identify latent resources 
who could be revealed. This is completely, completely different. In my opinion, the economist uh, or social scientist who uh, has um, uh, suggested this way of thinking is Hirschman. He was very close to this uh, way of thinking uh, as he wrote that development is the process to reveal latent resources. Latent resources. And here you have two types of latent resources. You have latent resources pre-existing, as for example um, uh, coal um, uh, stock. This exists and you can reveal thin of it or and uh, exploit it. Exploit it huh? But you remain in a market mechanism and optimization system. Okay? If we move to a knowledge economy, uh, what I hope, uh, uh, the question is uh, completely different. Uh, the problems are not given, the resources are not given, and you are not trying to optimize anything. You have to formalize the new problems and to find out the new resources uh, which are necessary uh, to answer uh, this, uh, this problem. The way of thinking is uh, systemic. It means that you cannot separate, this is I think important, the ecological question with the other questions. For example, the new way to think what is labor. The new way to think what are the needs. All these questions are very much interrelated and integrated. I think this is uh, typical uh, for a way of thinking in terms of development. Not to think in sectoral ways. I'm going to have a, a, an environment sector. It is not an environment sector. It is an ecological transition for the whole economy. If I want to think that uh, in, for example, agriculture, you will tell me agriculture, it's a sector. Okay, but le let's try to think like that. What does it mean? It means that my, eco my ecological transition means that I'm going to try to find what are uh, the products uh, I should uh, develop, protecting the nature and these progress products should be good for the people eating them. In order to do that you cannot save uh, the uh, ways of producing the agricultural goods today. It's impossible because uh, you need other competencies, other way of processing and another relation between uh, the, the, the earth, the water, uh, and the human, uh, the human being. You need competencies which are much higher. The uh, agriculteur, the paysan, uh, they have, he has to know how to save the water and not to try to, ha to, try to have more water for his intensive production. So the, the, the forms uh, of the relationship between the needs, uh, the nature, and the labor process are completely different. And if you want, I will send you uh, an article based exactly on, on that with, with facts uh, explaining uh, that. Um, Uh, picking the winners or interactions. You may pick the winners uh, and try to conciliate that uh, with uh, interactions. If you consider the winners as uh, um, open actors and not as closed actors, it means uh, that uh, their performances uh, should be evaluated and uh, not uh, only according to their own objectives, but 
according to the objectives of the system, they are a component component of it. Okay, um, I have tried to do that in Midi Pyrenees uh, because uh, uh, I, I try to advise the, the Greek government, but I try to advise to uh, the regional council of my region uh, for um, uh, economic question and industrial questions. And it is not the Toulouse School of Economics who do that, I do that. And I'm very uh, uh, proud of that. Um, and I've told them, instead of giving money to individual firms, for example, Airbus. Airbus uh, became, uh, till for two years, uh, each year around 25 million euros of direct and indirect, indirect subventions um, coming from the regional council. And I've explained to the regional council, you can save this money. Uh, the efficiency of this money is zero. You, you should uh, get this money, these 25 millions, and spend them to support projects. To support projects. To support projects between firms, between firms and laboratories. Uh, and they ask me, what sort of firms do you mean? if you don't mean Airbus? And the answer is a sort of picking the winner, if you want. Yeah? Um, I uh, have called uh, these firms structural firms. It means firms who are able to, um, to uh, pool the whole, uh, the whole system. And not to pull the whole system because they are big and they buy a lot of things or have a lot of employees, but to pull the system because they innovate. They have uh, new ways uh, to organize themselves. Uh, I give you just one example uh, to finish uh, my, this answer. Uh, the normal relationships between Airbus and the subcontractors, the normal relationships are um, I choose the subcontractor by giving him uh, uh, work to do and I choose him because he's cheaper as uh, the other ones. And I have a lot of them. And uh, what we see today is that Airbus do not work like that. Airbus works not, not anymore with sub subcontractors, but with pivot firms, pivot firms. What does it mean, pivot firms? It means firms who are able to have two roles, two objectives, um, a techno-industrial one, and an institutional one. It's very close to uh, what I said just before. These firms are not firms uh, able to produce equipments. They built, they conceive and build systems and not, more, not anymore equipments. It means that a firm as, as Airbus doesn't buy any more tires or a uh, braking uh, system, c'est les freins, ça, hein? braking system. Um, a, a firm as Airbus buys the whole uh, train d'atterrissage, the landing system. And the firm which is able to produce the landing system is a, a, a pivot firm, is able to produce a system and not just an equipment. And this pivot firm place the coordination role <coughs> between Airbus <coughs> and the subcontractors. This is a an, an very innovative process, you see. It's not only the product, it's the way to organize. And these are typical, the, fir typical the firms a regional council should support. If we want to anchor a firm a very huge firm as Airbus uh, in uh, the region Midi-Pyrenees, we have to be aware that this anchoring 
depends on these uh, firms. So in some sense, picking the winners is getting out such firms which are structuring for the whole system. Did you understand? Uh, yeah? OK. And the last point very shortly. Um, uh, I don't use it. In not, it's not in my lexical uh, protectionism. Because protectionism, for me, is closing the system and, and trying to um, uh, avoid, in some sense, uh, the overall uh, pressure. Of, uh, and this not is not my, my way of thinking. Huh? My way of thinking is to try to define new social norms, to define new environmental norms, to define new um, financial norms. And I think the, the, this uh, uh, way of thinking uh, is much more uh, linked to try to find new compromises to work out the new compromises we need uh, instead to say well the rules are that I don't want to play them and I close in some sense my economic and social system to protect my system I think this is not the correct way the correct way is really to try to find common preferences and to work out the new norms. I, tried to, I have tried to, to define the principle of uh, the definancialization on the macroeconomic level. And this is typically, for me, a way to, to find out the new norms we need according to uh, finance. And I think it's much more efficient than to say, these are the norms of the financialization. I don't want to import them. I don't want to be polluted from these norms. I think this way of thinking is um, extreme uh, static and not comprehensive. Mm -hmm. so this is, um, Thank you very much. Hold on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I'm okay. laughs>